The following interview was conducted with A.G. Redd, head of the Department of Educational Studies at the College of Education for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, July 23, 2010 at Stewart Center. Then here is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Good morning, Professor Rudd, and thank you very much. Thank Start you, Catherine. Out to it's been great to be here. Thanks. Tell us a little about already. where you were born and your parents and sure. early years. Sure. I was born in uh, Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and uh, my parents were Anthony and Lucy Rudd. She passed away when I was four, and then I got a, uh, you know, my mother, whom I now call my mother, is really my stepmother. Um, uh, my father were married in 1959. And so I grew up in the Berkshires of Western Massachusetts, and uh, uh, so I'm a native New Englander. What about a little bit about high school? What was that like? I went to uh, Pittsfield High School. Uh, we lived outside of Pittsfield. I went to Pittsfield High School, and the time that I went there was uh, there was high schools were 10 through 12 and junior high 7 through 9. So at 10th grade, I went there. And the interesting thing about that was that it was the year before another high school was built. And so we had double sessions. The juniors and seniors were very early in the morning, and the sophomores, which I was, were in the afternoon up until about 5.30 at night, so we'd go home in the dark and so forth. Then I went to Taconic, Taconic High School in uh, the western part of uh, uh, west side of Pittsfield in, uh, for junior and senior year. Any clubs or? Community? Yeah, I was an athlete, and I was a newspaper, one of the editors on the newspaper, student newspaper, and the yearbook, and things like that. Uh, did some social service. Um, ath athletics were important to me. I did running and soccer, so I enjoyed that too. Good. Okay. And then tell us how you selected uh, Dartmouth, and tell us about campus life. And sure. Well, I came from a Dartmouth family, so it almost selected me. Um, my I'm a third generation legacy at Dartmouth. My father and uh, my father uh, Anthony G. Rudd. I'm a junior, and my grandfather Anthony M. Rudd had gone to Dartmouth, and uh, I was more or less. Uh, you could say brainwashed, but in a positive way to go to Dartmouth, and I uh, went there and enjoyed it, and uh, took part in the activities that you would at a campus like that that's out in a very beautiful part of the country, went skiing and things like that. I was a, started off as a, um, thinking I'd be an English major, I then briefly, very briefly, uh, flirted with East Asian studies, uh, became a religion major, uh, finished up really thinking I'd like to do graduate work in philosophy because of a particular professor I had there at Dartmouth who was greatly influential to me, Joe Galloway, uh, who had gone to Northwestern University and he told me you ought to go there if you're interested in um, continental philosophy, European philosophy, which I was. So I went to Northwestern for graduate school after, after a year off uh, in which I did some uh, work and travel and then another uh, part of a time off in which I worked, and I went to Germany for about six weeks. Good, okay. So, uh, how was graduate school? You, went, you got your PhD there as well. Yeah, I did. I got my P uh, master's and PhD at Northwestern. Um, I studied with the same man that my mentor at Dartmouth had studied with and really enjoyed it, uh, William Earle. I also studied with Eric Heller, who's a famous, well, all of my uh, committee has passed away a number of years ago, but Eric Keller is very famous, mm -hmm. and James Eady. And uh, I enjoyed my time. I particularly enjoyed teaching because we had an opportunity to do not only TAing, which I did, but we also were able to teach freshman seminars on a topic of our own choosing at Northwestern, which was wonderful. So great. I, yeah, it was really a great time, so I enjoyed that. So. Then, well, tell us, what, did you ever serve in the military at all? I did not. I was drafted in, I wasn't, excuse me, I wasn't drafted. I was in the class in the fall of 1972, I believe it was, um, that uh, what were um, taken off the exemption for college. And my draft number, as I recall, it was 37, and they didn't get up to then. Uh, I went and talked to the, uh, and I was opposed to the Vietnam War, I went and I talked to the Dean of Students about, you know, conscientious objection and so forth, and basically, to make a long story short, I found out that he, 
To be a conscientious objector, you have to conscientiously object to all wars. And I decided, no, I, I really don't think I could do that. So I didn't be a, I wasn't a conscientious objector. I just left myself open. They didn't get to my numbers, so I wasn't drafted, and I didn't serve in the military service. But I did have some friends who were pulled out of college because they had very low draft numbers and went in. Oh, dear. So I knew that. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, should we talk a little about the North Carolina Center for the Advancement of Teachers? Is that where you, after you got your degree? Um, you? Well, after I got my degree, yeah. I went back to Dartmouth, and I was a um, uh, college admissions officer for four years. It's where I met my wife, and we had our, our daughter, who's our, still our only child. She's going to be 25 in September. Uh, and I worked at the admissions office, which was a lot of fun to be mm-hmm. back at Dartmouth. But then in 1986, I went to the North Carolina Center for the Advancement of Teaching, which was absolutely nothing at the time. It was a couple of offices. And now, of course, it's really a premier teacher renewal center with an absolutely gorgeous uh, set of buildings, a large staff, uh, really a unique program in the country for teacher professional development and renewal. It's in the a very beautiful part of North Carolina, out west of Asheville, and I just had a great time. We, we in the early years, we had a, a big, but it was a big pork barrel project for Western North Carolina, because the Speaker of the House in North Carolina was from the mountains, and he was bringing bringing a project back to the mountains. We had a lot of money, and it sort of set the tone of of kinds of things that we were able to do. We brought in Nobel Prize winners. We brought in uh, famous authors. We worked with all kinds of people. We worked with local craftsmen, uh, carpenters, um, politicians, local local people, musicians, but also people that you read about in the New York Times. We brought all different kinds of people in for these professional development seminars with teachers, and it was just wonderful. I really enjoyed it. And I really, what, one of the things that I really enjoyed about that was that it was a startup project, and I've done a few of those in my career, and I really enjoy startup projects, you know, getting things up and going, the excitement and energy of that. I don't much enjoy, like, I mean, I don't mean to pick on Harvard because it's, you know, I'm a Dartmouth graduate, but I, I don't think I'd enjoy working at a very established, wealthy university like Harvard where you're sort of essentially polishing the silver. I mean, that's probably a, you know, a, an exaggeration because there's lots of good things going it's on very, there. You use the word established. Yeah, and established is better. I, I like sort of new things where I can make a big difference right. rather and than just sort and of... you know that the contribution can be made and is made and appreciated and you can... Yeah, that, that, that's... And I think lots of people enjoy that kind of work. Right. I mean, some people do like working for very established in steady places, but I don't yeah. as much. So yeah, I am. Um, Is the center still going? Oh yes, okay. it's thriving. In fact, it has another site on the coast of North Carolina in Ocracoke, and it's still doing very well working with teachers. So, um, well, well a known good, place. Good opportunity. It and was. Then from there, you came. Then from there, I came here. How did um, were they? Uh, how did you hear about the opening? Did somebody touch the Chronicle of Higher Education? Okay. I had been recruited for various other jobs, but I did see this job. I knew about Purdue because I went at Northwestern. I came down here for a conference, and, you know, I knew about the Big Ten and all that because I'd gone to Northwestern. So I applied, and uh, that year I was interviewed at three universities, and IU was one of them, and it was just weird because I, you know, I didn't know anyone at Purdue, and I didn't really know anyone at IU except for one person. I, I was interviewed at these two Indiana universities, so I went and I was offered the position at Purdue, and it was a good position working with uh, Dean Marilyn Herring. And uh, she was, uh, it was only her second, end of her second year, so we were really involved with uh, what really defined her deanship in those early years I was the undergraduate teacher education reform. And so that took a lot of energy of, of hers and a good deal of mine and we spent a lot of time reforming the teacher education program the, uh, bef- you know, to emphasize the blocks, uh, block sequenced uh, curriculum, a, a spiraling sequential curriculum, a um, more field experience and expo- much more exposure to things like special education for all of the students. 
And so that really, you know, defined her, her deanship, I think, because she uh, stepped down in 2001. And I was along for the ride on that and worked with her and helped her and, and worked with faculty. So I was dean. I mean, I'm sorry. I was associate dean from 1994 to 2001. Mm -hmm. Then I uh, took a sabbatical, went back to the faculty, um, and uh, taught uh, especially I got to learn how to teach the big undergraduate course that we have in history and philosophy of education that all teacher education students, no matter what their major is, have to take. And I developed some of my own specialties. I developed a course in higher education in film and fiction that I taught three times that I really enjoyed. I developed a seminar on John Dewey. And I taught our you know, master's level philosophy of education course and really enjoyed all of it. I just had a good time. Um, I wasn't looking to get back into administration, but for a variety of reasons, in when was it? 2008, George Hind had le left mid-year. Kevin Kelly uh, stepped up from being the department head to the interim dean, and my colleague Alal Samara Pungavan had agreed to only be the interim uh, head for six months. Um, we had a failed search for the, f uh, for the dean that year, so uh, Professor Kelly stayed on. Uh, Professor Samara Pungavan said, look, I, the six months is up, and so I was asked to come back and be the department head, which I did in the summer of 2008, and have done that for two years now. I want to make an uh, observation. The interim head, in the interim, and you wrote something on that, serving as an interim has been a stimulating assignment and one that should be viewed positively and used more deliberately in higher education. That's interesting. And, and uh, did you get any feedback from that? Did I did. I had people from around the country write me, and people right here, uh, Dean Tony Hawkins, wrote me immediately when he saw it in the, uh, you know, little right, clip from it in the Chronicle that morning. Yeah. And uh, I was, uh, I talked to a number of people about it. I then developed it into a book chapter um, with Walter Gemelch and John Shu for a book with the, um, I believe, the Josie Bass series on academic leadership. But, I mean, that, that one little article I really enjoyed doing, sure. and it allowed me to reflect. It was toward the end of my interim time, and it allowed me to reflect on, you know, what is it, because there are a lot of interims, as you know, Catherine, in higher education, you have people that leave or that pass away or that get it, you know, whatever. And you have somebody that steps in while a search is going on. So there's a lot of people that have served these roles, and, you know, for up to two years sometimes. And I, I just think it's a, it's a different kind of role because you're... It is. You're essentially... Uh, a lot of people will say, oh, well, you're just a placeholder, you know, just be there. And, but universities, especially now, are moving forward rapidly and, ra and responding to lots of outside pressures and budget cuts. So you have to make decisions as an interim. You have to treat it like, you know, this is my permanent job. I'm not just sort of warming the seat for the, guy to, the next guy or gal to come in. This is, you know, you've got to do some things. So... I, I found it different because um, there were people that looked upon me as, well, we can cut AG some slack because he's just the interim. We don't, you know, and there were others that really wanted, you know, that, you know, understandably had decisions have to be made about their careers that looked upon me as, you're the department head, you do it. So I talk about that in that article a little bit. And, uh, yes, as well, uh, the words are well chosen, and it, it's well thought through. Thank you. Well, I spent a lot of time on that, but also I must say the Chronicle of Higher Education does a lot of heavy editing and feedback, so um, that article was really crafted with an, uh, another editor who was, uh, who was wonderful. I mean, right. she made it sound better. And so. that's why that uh, has the reputation that that particular publication carries and has for years and years. And yes, it's good it to does. Have the online, which Absolutely. I do. Um, can you talk before we ask? I ask you about the headship. Can you talk a little bit about some of the research that you've been involved in? I know you talked sure. about your courses. Sure. Um, one of the er really my main area is uh, the moral dimensions of teaching and learning, and that can be in K twelve or, or P twelve as we call it now before K. Uh, and higher education and higher education. So I, I focus on, you know, what um, 
in P12, I focus on issues of moral education and how, you know, what are the various ways of looking at how people learn about uh, ethics and uh, ethical decision making and, and moral behavior and things like that. In higher education, what I've done, especially here at Purdue, is uh, focus on research ethics and have you know written some things, but also mostly served on committees. I've been on um, research misconduct committees with Peter Dunn. I've, I've done things with Gita Ramaswamy, who was in the graduate school until she left to go to Oregon State University. And I've focused on a number of different areas with people. Linda Naemi in technology, OLS, who's a, you know, a Murphy Award-winning teacher who focuses on teaching undergraduates about ethics. So those are really my research, main research areas. And another research area that really was one of the reasons I came to Purdue, I must admit, is, are the moral dimensions of the human-animal bond. And I met Alan Beck, who's the Dorothy McAllister Professor of Animal Ecology here in the School of Veterinary Medicine. I met him in North Carolina at a teacher seminar when I was interviewing at Purdue. Long story short, Alan's one of my best friends. His wife was our real estate agent when we moved here, and I have worked with him uh, here and in Florida and uh, given presentations with him about the human-animal bond. So it's been a, a real satisfying engagement mm -hmm. for me. And it's really key. The, it, the, is. Yeah, right. it is. It is. Very, very pleasant. Uh, go ahead on the department. Any, um, I like, I'm going to do this quote again. Teaching is not just about the transmission of knowledge or even its expansion. Its calling is higher than that. It seeks wisdom beyond knowledge alone by applying knowledge to life, especially the life of students, and the larger community, and thereby to express life itself. Well, nicely said. Thank Talk you. About your Thank you, Catherine. Sure. Yeah, well, that quote just sort of sums up my philosophy of teaching and learning. And I try to, um, as best I can, encourage that in my own department as department head. Um, my department is really a wonderful congregation, aggregation of very interesting and passionate individuals. It is not a, a unitary department by any means. It's more like a confederation. We have a number of different sub-disciplines within my department with competing epistemologies and ways of working with students and what counts as a good publication and all that kind of stuff. So it's at times it's kind of exhausting, to, mentally exhausting to think about the ways in which the department works together. But I think it does, and I think there's a great deal of respect. What my colleagues value research, they value good, um, uh, good, well-published and well-researched uh, inquiry, but they also value that inquiry being applicable to the problems of education and society. So we in education, it's an applied discipline. We basically look at the problems and concerns and ways in which we can support students and try to do that. So um, It's a big challenge. It's a big challenge, right. and I think there's, there's just a number of, of uh, absolutely wonderful people that I work with at Purdue and have in the past and, and uh, continue to do so. You have the gifted research and, and of course, Professor yes, we Matthews do. and I knew him and, yes, and we did do. a lot of uh, did a lot of literature searches for him when he was yes, here. Yes, nice I person. would I would imagine you did. Yeah. John Feldhusen uh, was is really a leader in the field. He passed away just recently, but yeah. he's a uh, was a wonderful man and and you know, kind of an inspiration to me. Although I'm not in that area, I do remember uh, him talking to me about my you know, my, basically my career, and he was very, very supportive of me, and always was, and always was a friendly guy. Uh, so I really like John, and I missed him, and I do miss him now. Right. Uh, we have uh, Sidney Moon and Marcia Gentry are the two people, Sidney Moon, uh, right after John, and then she became associate dean, and then Marcia Gentry came here a number of years ago, and is a dynamic leader of that institute now. So and it's been yeah, established and going for a long time. Absolutely. All right. uh, faculty recruitment, you involved in that too as a head? I am. Okay. I am. Our uh, not so much now because, as you know, there have been budget cuts at Purdue. So we, right. we as a college only proposed four searches last year, and the provost allowed two, one per department, which is really tiny. 
But when I was interim head that year, I hired three outstanding faculty members, one in higher education administration, one in educational psychology who's just promoted to full professor, and one in special education who just uh, a couple of years ago got an enormous $5 million grant. Or maybe it was a $3 million grant over five years, but it was really a large grant. And so I'm very proud of those people that I hired, That's or helped good. to hire, really. I mean, I signed the papers and coaxed them, but they chose Purdue, and uh, we're, we were very pleased to have them. That's good. Um, diversity, has that, uh, that's increased over time? It has. Right. Um, uh, I just was speaking to a, I'll talk about faculty diversity, I'll talk about student diversity. I'll talk about faculty diversity first, because that's a bit easier. My department is arguably the most diverse department in the co in the university. And I say that because we, we don't have, um, and we haven't over the past had a great deal of uh, diversity with respect to African Americans and Latinos, Latinas, but we have an enormous international diversity. We have uh, faculty that have been from China, Greece, India, uh, New Zealand, um, Japan. We have people from all over the world in my department. We do have some racial diversity. We do have a, a very dynamic young woman who's uh, Latina, who uh, we brought here three years ago, who's wonderful uh, in uh, cultural foundations of education. But we, uh, we, and that goes into talking about students. We haven't been in our college and this is not just Purdue, it's certainly a lot of other universities. Um, we haven't been as successful in recruiting um, African Americans, Latinos, Latinas, and Native Americans. Um, I'm very pleased to be part of dissertation committees in our other department, curriculum and instruction, with Navajo and Hopi graduate students who are wonderful. And we've had some Native American students in my department. We have very few African Americans and a uh, smattering of uh, Latino, Latina students. Mm -hmm. That's a challenge, I think. And, it, and, and then, when, when we, then when we get to undergraduate, um, basically this, these figures may be a little bit off, but I've quoted them before. Uh, nationally, I think it may still be the case that, that uh, K-12 teachers are... 80% women and 80% white. And so to be a man or to be a black man or a black woman is a, uh, an anomaly in teaching. And it's a, to be a, a man in elementary school teaching is a real anomaly. We do, we have tried to up our, we, let's, let me just say we've upped our percentages and we're doing better. And our accrediting agencies say we're doing better. But it's a challenge. It is, it's a big challenge and it just seems to get bigger. It does. It does. It doesn't get any other. Uh, deans, you talked about Marilyn Herring. You want to make a couple comments on the deans you served under? Sure. Marilyn Herring hired me. I learned a great deal from Marilyn Herring about. Uh, she and I really have very similar personalities, and uh, we were very much in tune with each other. I learned a great deal from her. Um, sort of in the middle of my time as an associate dean. Uh, we would have these, you know, periodic meetings, you know, in which we talk about topics. But she and I decided to do something called thinking like a dean. Uh, she was really, now that I look back on it, she was grooming me to eventually be a dean. And so we would find these things in the Chronicle or somewhere where, you know, a faculty member is complaining about this or a budget cut for this, and she'd sort of give me these things. And we'd go, I'd go and I'd write, you know, what are the what are the, the major factors here? What would you do in this situation? How would you handle it? And I'd sort of think about that, and then the next meeting I'd come back and we'd discuss it. And we did that for about a year. And Great. really enjoyed doing that. And I, I wrote a little bit, a, a little piece in an uh, um, academic administration newsletter about that. I just really enjoyed doing that, thinking like a dean. It was, it was good. It's good. In the, yeah. It's like it's the case, like the case it's studies. A, it's basically exactly. case studies That's and what right. would you do good. in this situation. Right. Yeah. And uh, some of them were real, and some of them we made up. Um, so but they was, could occur. They could occur, exactly. Right. 
So then I worked under uh, Jerry Peters when he was interim dean, and I very much respect Jerry Peters because he is a man that was thrust into a difficult situation, and you always knew where you stood with Jerry. He he really uh, did not. He was he's not at well. He's the ab absolutely opposite of deceptive. He's completely direct and clear, and you know where you stand. And so I, I enjoyed that that aspect of working right. with Jerry. You can work with people like that. Mm -hmm. well. I worked with George Hind, although when, when George was here, I was a faculty member, so I, I did, I was a friend of George, but I didn't work closely with him on our leadership team during that time. Uh -huh. And then, of course, then Kevin was the... Interim. Kevin was my department head and then became interim dean, and Kevin is a very thoughtful, um, quiet leader who really thinks through situations and is, uh, looks at all different sides of things. And I really learned a lot from Kevin in that, in doing, in, in dealing you with certain kinds of situations. I you did. I which did. Is great. Right. I did. Next on the editorial boards, you talk about education and culture, you're the editor, and then any of the other ones that you want to make a comment sure. on. Sure. I was, um, I've been privileged to be on the editorial board and then the editor for six years, just stepped off that a, a month ago, of the Journal Education and Culture, which is the, uh, the um, international peer-reviewed journal of the John Dewey Society. And I was very pleased to be able to bring it here from the University of Iowa. And it was a, it was a good journal at the University of Iowa uh, for a variety of reasons. It was a very limited journal. And I think that I was able to, with the help of uh, the late Margaret Hunt, Tom Bacher, and uh, my graduate student, Jawan Kim, especially, was able to bring it up, uh, you know, ramp it up. We got an ISSN number. We got it, made it look like an academic journal instead of a high school literary magazine. Uh, it vastly increased the number of submissions. Um, so it was a really good run. I enjoyed it. And uh, I decided to step down because I was starting to repeat myself. And uh, yeah. that's not that I'd run out of ideas, but sort of it's it was good. time to move on and have somebody else do it. That's right, exactly. And you're on the editorial board of, uh, how about Studies in Philosophy and Education? Yes, that I'm, that's an international journal um, based in, um, it's published by uh, Kluwer, and uh, the editors are all over the, the uh, the world. Uh, I've been on that for a number of years. That's a, and then published in it. That's a very good journal. Um, one journal that I was particularly proud of to be associated with because it's the tops in my field is educational theory, which is published by the University of Illinois. Mm -hmm. And my very dear and good friend Nicholas Berbulis has been the editor of that for 20 years. He's about to step down from that, but uh, I learned a lot from him and continue to learn a lot from him. Yeah. And a couple of other ones. What about the um, Educational Policy and Alice Archives? Oh, that's a great journal. That's one of the first uh, on, totally online journals started in 1993 by Jean Glass, um, who's a, a preeminent educational researcher and somebody who's very interested in online publication. He does not uh, think much of paper journals that take three or four years to publish articles and he wanted uh, something more instant and more widespread. And so I was a founding um, uh, editorial board member of that and, and I'm still on it. I mean, I, there, it's gone through a couple of editor changes. Gene's no longer editing it and I'm still on it and it still publishes great stuff. Very good. Mm -hmm. uh, any, the um, Journal of College and Character, you're on the review board for that. I, well, I was. Okay. I just stepped off that. Uh, that was a, also an online journal that came out of Florida State University, which has an absolutely terrific higher education program. And uh, so I focused on that because it, it, it dovetails with my interests in character development in the college years. So. Right. Uh, that's I was on that and really enjoyed my time on that. Okay. Um, let's talk about the Purdue Press here on the sure. been on the editorial board. Are you the chair at the current? Time? I am not. Oh, okay. a um, Alan Beck uh, just stepped down as chair, and Angelica Duran in the English department is the current chair. Oh, okay. uh, I've been on the press board. This is my second stint. I was on it in the mid '90s, from '95 to '98. Bob Ringel appointed me to that, along with uh, David Sanders and. 
I, I was, uh, enjoyed my first time on the press. Uh, I was able to chair the search committee uh, that hired Thomas Bacher. Um, I was able to do a number of things. I was the chair of, of the, the board for, I think, about a year or two years. And then, I, and then Tom, before he left in, in 2008, asked me to be on the board again. So I came on the board uh, the interim year when Brian Schaefer was the acting director and then now Charles Watkinson. Uh, I've been on the board again for two years and have really enjoyed seeing how the press has developed. Uh, the, the press is, a, is, is really a gem at Purdue because it's a, by university press standards it's small. It puts out about 25 books a year. But the books it puts out are absolutely gorgeous. They are, f a lot of them, in va the vast majority of them are focused on disciplines that are prominent at Purdue, such as agriculture and engineering and, um, and other kinds of disciplines as a good humanities series also. So yeah, I think it's just a really terrific press. Right. And now the facility, now that they've moved, it's a lot better. Exactly. Know? They're now up here in the Stewart Center. They're right. no longer down in South Campus right. Courts, and so they're much more up near the action here, and that's, that's great. Right, exactly. Um, the uh, Information Age Publishing, um, you're an advisor on that. Could you just make a comment on that? I certainly can. Okay. That's one of the, the highlights, uh, recent highlights of my work. Information Age Publishing is a, uh, a press that puts out education, management, and um, some other social sciences is what they specialize in. It is run by George Johnson, who is a young man, but with an amazing publishing pedigree. I can't remember off the top of my head the exact things, but uh, his father started Greenwood. His, his, his great his his grandfather was Ablex and, and JAI. And he's, he's like a third or fourth generation publisher. So yes, I am an advisor for their education list along with Gene Glass. And uh, so we were, we were able to um, look at manuscripts turn them around quickly, publish them quickly in a nice, uh, you know, format. Uh, it's not an online press. It's an actual, you know, paper book sure. press. And so one of the highlights I had since t uh, joining that as an advisor, and I believe it was about eight months ago, is that one of my colleagues here in the College of Education, Luciana de Oliveira, uh, submitted a book. I worked with her very closely on that book, which is about the teaching of history based on her dissertation. And that book of hers is coming out this fall. So I'm very oh, pleased that's, about that's, that. That's nice. So, a couple of things on the College of Education. One of the new programs, the Study Abroad, yes. they have. The College of Education, when I came to Purdue in 1994, had a very skeletal study abroad program. They were just getting the Zamorano program in Honduras off the ground. And since that time, fast forward till now, we have, I, I don't know how many programs we have, but we do have programs in exotic places like we've been to South Africa, uh, we've been to uh, Russia, um, England, um, Gosh, I'm trying to think of all the places. Have you been uh, in, uh, anything in Asia? A in India. Okay. We have our undergraduate program. It goes every May semester to India. Um, so, and I'm trying to think. Uh, I believe we are developing things in China. We, I think, we have a faculty member who's looking at Vietnam. So it's really, really grown. Uh, really grown. Uh, the, you know, the Middle East. Um, countries there. We, we do things, uh, collaborate sure. with countries there. With Kuwait, we've had some exchanges. So there's a lot going on, really, in study and abroad. And that, and that really, you know, President Jiski's one of his emphasis, emphases was on uh, ramping up study abroad, and we followed that. And our faculty are very interested in that. So and the students have gotten a lot out of it, too. So they have. Great. They have. It broadens them. They have. They love it. And... Uh, so it's gone very well. Good, okay. Um, the College of Education, the 15th anniversary, and in comments, and they gave that Lifetime Achievement Award to Dr. Kane. Is Dr. Kane still alive? No, he's not. Okay. He's, uh, I couldn't remember whether Bob he Bob Kane is no longer alive. Uh, I did know him. He was um, 
the first dean of the college from 1989 to uh, um, 1991, and then Marilyn Herring came, I sure. believe. Right. He was uh, uh, a, a, an interesting man. Um, I, I never really worked with him, but I was impressed by the fact that he and his wife, toward the end of their li his life, used to go on steamers. They go on like these trips on, you know, cargo ships, and they'd sort of be on these ships and go to these ports and travel around that way. And so I just found that really interesting about him. <laughs> it certainly is. Yes. Right? <laughs> uh, family, could you talk a couple comments sure. on that? Sure, sure. Um, my wife Rita is a Purdue MFA in creative writing. She's a literary fiction writer, uh, editor, and has taught as a continuing lecturer in the English department. Uh, she is English. She comes from the Isle of Wight and has lived in this country since 1983. Uh, we have a da one daughter, Rachel, who is a, an aspiring Hollywood actress who is living in Hollywood and is uh, doing what aspiring Hollywood actresses do, go to auditions, work in restaurants to pay the bills, uh, she graduated it with a, a degree in theater from Northwestern University in 2007, and she's been out in California since that fall. Okay. So okay. Though, that's my family. I, we have, uh, we've had over the years numerous pets, and we consider them family, too. We Absolutely. now have three cats and a dog. Absolutely, right. Any uh, hobbies or special interests? Oh, gosh. I'm kind of a workaholic. Okay. Let me think, though. I do... You, I, you take care of the animals. I take care of the animals. That's I do enjoy. Um, I, I, I enjoy talking about sports and watching and following Purdue athletics Good. very much. Good. We're in so, the same ballpark. Yes. Purdue football, Purdue basketball, men's and women's, and and then and all the other sports. I really enjoy just talking to people about that and, and being there as well. And being there, That's I just right. enjoy enjoy that very much um, so I, I listen to the NPR station that's a big part of my morning is to get up very early to uh, when I was writing my book on Albert Schweitzer which I finished just recently I would get up and do my writing before work started but now that I'm sort of transitioning out of Purdue I've taken a break from that but I get up very early my wife is a night owl I'm a lark I get up early I get a cup of tea, uh, PG Tips, uh, with the number one tea in Britain, and I get my iPhone, and I do my email and Facebook, and I have my headphones on, and I listen to Kristen Malavenda talk about local news, and then the NPR morning show. Super. Sounds good to me. Do you have an out, uh, outstanding event? Do you care to share with us? Anything that comes to mind? Outstanding event? What mm -hmm. do you mean by that? Any event that's like, well, sometimes many people have shared with me when I met my wife. Oh, of course. Oh, yeah, that kind of event. Yeah, and that's, oh, yeah. that's wonderful. Or, yes. or participating over the years at commencement. It's just wonderful to participate. Yes, well, I could say, you know, mm, I could talk about meeting my wife because right. we met at, uh, that's I'll talk briefly about that. Yeah. We met at, um, both of us had studied philosophy, and she was on a visit to Dartmouth College. I was working there. We met at the reception of a philosophy talk by the very famous British philosopher A.J. Eyre. Now, my philosophical tradition couldn't be any different than A.J. Eyre, but I, of course, wanted to go hear him, and he was okay. great, Freddie Eyre. And so I met my wife uh, at the uh, reception for that. She was traveling. We met, and they went from there. Um, but participating in commencements is a great example because... Uh, I'll just tell you this, one of the things, I'm, I'm leaving Purdue on August 5th, but one of my uh, treasured doctoral students, Alan Udal Rashidi, who came here uh, courtesy of the government of Kuwait, who's written an absolutely terrific dissertation, does, you know, she's the kind of doctoral student you want to you wanna clone. She doesn't cause any problems, she does her work. She uh, does very good work, and she does it on time, and she's done. And so I am, even though I'm leaving Purdue on the 5th, uh, my wedding anniversary is August 6th, 
and we're packing up and moving, uh, I am going to hood her on August 7th of 2010 here at Purdue because she's coming back from Kuwait and I want to be there for that's her. Very nice. So that's going to mean a lot to me. That's very nice. Now the next stage. College, the dean of the college. Of yes. The uh, State. Yeah, this is interesting. Um, uh, I wasn't looking to leave Purdue. In fact, we bought a, uh, a different house two years ago, so that sort of signaled that I wasn't looking to leave Purdue, but I was, I've been contacted by search firms, um, about four or five different search firms over the last year about, about deanships. And I was uh, contacted by Washington State University, the search firm that was conducting that search. And I didn't even know they were, uh, well, I did know that they were, they were having a search, but I didn't pay attention to it. And I was contacted by them, and I immediately my ears perked up because one of my favorite former colleagues, Brian French, is at Washington State University, a young man who did his Ph.D. at Purdue and then stayed on here until he moved out there in 2008. And so I thought, well, I'll ask Brian, you know, what do they want out there? And so, and so it went from there. So to make a long story short, I wasn't looking to leave Purdue. I'm happy at Purdue, but I was presented with the, these opportunities and I started to think, you know, what might be the next step and what would be an interesting uh, place to live and so it moved from there. Okay. And you're starting? Uh, I start you? August 16th. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we move in like two weeks. <laughs> in closing, any com something I forgot to ask or anything that you'd like to say in closing? Um, I've I think my, my 16 years at Purdue, I, I said this to, um, to several people who've asked me, you know, why are you leaving, or, you know, you've been here a long time, and, and, and they've, you know, sort of wondered. And I've said to them, I wasn't, like I just said, I wasn't looking to leave. I, you know, I enjoy my job at Purdue, and I like the people I work with, and there's lots to do, and Purdue's a great place. But I found that after the number of years that I was in the College of Education that I felt like I was repeating myself. I had, I've had sort of a mental list, not a bucket list, but a mental list of things that I wanted to do at Purdue. I wanted to serve on the University Senate. I did that and I chaired the Educational Policy Committee. I wanted to serve on the Purdue Press Board. I wanted to be a faculty fellow. I wanted to um, teach a course on higher education, all these numbers of different things. Uh, I was able to do all of them, and then I started doing them again. I started, I was department head again. I was on the press board again, and I thought, this, I'm starting to sort of repeat myself, and I and maybe it's a good time. And so this came to, you know, as I said, I wasn't looking, sure. but then when the opportunities presented themselves, I started thinking, yeah, I'm sort of repeating myself. Maybe time to move on. And our daughter's grown, and somewhat launched in California and it was a good time for my wife and me to try something different. I want to thank you very much Dr. Wright. Thank you my Catherine. Pleasure. This has been really wonderful.